I'm Nicola Kelly, and this is Silenced, a podcast from human rights organisation Article 19. In each episode of this series, we'll hear the stories of journalists and activists around the world whose governments attempt to rein them in and cover up the truth. On the 2nd of October 2018, Jamal Hasoji, arguably Saudi Arabia's most prominent journalist and an outspoken critic of the country's government, walked into the Saudi consulate in Istanbul to collect documents he needed to get married, but he never reappeared. Investigators later concluded that Jamal Hasoji had been ambushed, forcibly restrained, drugged and asphyxiated. His body was then dismembered by 15 Saudi assassins connected to the Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, or MBS, stuffed into bags and discarded. Six months after the murder, Iyad al-Baghdadi, a renowned writer, academic and a friend to Jamal, was visited by the Norwegian security services at his home in Oslo, where they informed him there was a credible threat to his life. Here he describes what happened that afternoon and how his life has changed since then. It was a strange day, April 25th, 2019. Norwegian intelligence agents showed up at my door in Oslo. And I remember the first thing I told them is like, what took you so long? They took me to a safe location and uh, they proceeded to tell me that I'm being placed under protection due to threats against my life, which are coming from Saudi Arabia. The way that they phrased it, they said a partner intelligence agency told us. and. It was a few days later that The Guardian managed to actually confirm that this was indeed the CIA. I actually was aware that I am working on something very dangerous for a while. I mean, I I was aware that I'm in danger. I was already collaborating with Jamal on many projects before his murder, before his death. And one of those was really about disinformation monitoring, uh, which is something that, you know, my team does now, you know, much more professionally. But the idea came up in the summer of 2018. Um, Jamal, he thought that maybe we can find some funders for such a project. Unfortunately, he was killed too soon. But I went on to use the same techniques to eventually expose that something really strange is going on between MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, and Jeff Bezos. Tonight, we are learning shocking new details about an alleged Saudi plot. It is an astonishing allegation. Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos' phone was hacked by Saudi Arabia. I went on to expose this attempted blackmail of Jeff Bezos, linked, of course, to the fact that Jeff Bezos was the owner of uh, the Washington Post. You know, Jamal Khashoggi worked for the Washington Post, so ultimately Jeff Bezos was his boss. Six months earlier, this Saudi journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, had begun writing articles for the paper, articles highly critical of the crown prince. And of course, there's lots of uh, intrigue around that because it was a strange attempt by an autocrat to not only silence a journalist by the ultimate form of censorship, which is assassination, but also to blackmail the wealthiest man on earth to get him to curb the Washington Post, to change the coverage, to, you know, to stop this whole Justice for Jamal campaign. So knowing that, you know, I was working on something pretty dangerous. And knowing that I had sources in Saudi Arabia telling me what was going on around MBS, I actually eventually printed out a little report. Uh, So there's no way here in Norway to actually communicate or contact the, the Norwegian intelligence, which is called the PST. And so the normal process that I had to go through is actually file a report, a police report. So I had to print this out, go to the police station and file it. And of course, the police station had no idea what to do with this. Because, you know, they're, they're used to, I don't know, someone losing his phone or a couple having a fight over a breakup or something like that. They're, they're not used to someone walking in and saying, hey, uh, Hamad bin Salman wants to kill me. And, you know, giving this report, explaining this whole complicated scheme with, with disinformation and hacking software and, uh, and a murdered journalist. And so they sat on it. They didn't know what to do with it. But eventually it kind of made its way to Norwegian intelligence and uh, they actually had it in their, in their hand when they, when they showed up. And so that's why I said, you know, what took you so long? Uh, 
my relationship with Jamal, I mean, it's interesting because it started in around 2014, 2015. I was actually in a refugee camp in Norway at the time. I was still applying for asylum. I did not trust Jamal before, before his exile. I looked at him with suspicion. He was someone who was aligned with the Saudi government. He was a supporter of the Saudi system. And naturally, I mean, it's natural for someone like me to to look at him with suspicion. 2014 was a depressing year for a lot of us, not only because this was the year where the first phase of the Arab Spring died. Uh, It was also the year where ISIS became the priority for the region. And the narrative around the region changed from hope and inspiration to terrorism. And I remember the end of the year, Jamal was speaking, he was tweeting, and he was the words that he was using were very bitter. And he was resentful of how things came to this, you know, as like we had so much hope. And now it's all about ISIS and all about a resurgence of autocracy, etc. And I responded, and uh, I was not polite. Uh, I kind of insulted him. And I said something like, you're the ones aligned with those regimes. You, you can't get to complain now, you're aligned with them. Interesting thing is that Jamal, instead of blocking me, instead of like shooting something back at me, he actually followed me. And that kind of tells you something about Jamal. He he was always interested, always curious, always wanted to get closer to things that maybe make him a little bit uncomfortable. By 2017, the Saudi system itself had changed enough that Jamal Khashoggi was no longer an insider. He was no longer an elite. It is becoming a one-man rule. He has a control on everything. He is creating an environment of, uh, of intimidation and fear. Saudis are being silenced. Things are not being transparent. And that is not a good recipe for reform in Saudi Arabia. And he needs to do something about that. Right. Uh, he was considered a dissident. He was considered a threat to the new order, even though he did not consider himself to be that. So it was in August of 2017 that he eventually chose to self-exile He left, I believe, for the United Kingdom and then from there to the United States. And from the United States, he, within a few weeks, he started writing for the Washington Post. You know, between then and then, between 2014 and 2017, he actually attempted something. He wanted, like, one of his his dreams was to start a free, independent, pan-Arab TV station. You know, he engaged Al Jazeera a lot, but he a lot of the time he was critical of Al Jazeera and he always was very aware that Al Jazeera in the end is funded by the Qatari government. And so he wanted to create something that is a counterbalance and something that can be independent, uh, which is a tall order of when you're Saudi, uh, connected to the, to the Saudi royal family. And then when he chose to establish the station in Bahrain, out of all places, that, you know, bastion of free speech, of course, being sarcastic. And uh, they did not exactly say you can't have that. They allowed him to sink the entire cost of creating a TV station. <laughs> and then eventually, on the first day of broadcast, they uh, took it off the air and they revoked its license. I think that was the point when Jamal stopped trying. I think until that point, he was still trying. He's like, maybe there is space there. Maybe maybe I can talk to these people. Maybe they can, I can talk some sense. Maybe I can make them see my point of view. And his point of view was, uh, again, thinking as a Saudi, he's like, if you, instead of complaining of Al Jazeera and trying to, to hack it or shut it down, etc., why don't you just create, you know, create your own national media, which is also open and free and uh, can kind of carry your perspective. Unfortunately, the old guard or the new order in Saudi Arabia really did not see it that way, and they see free speech as an extreme threat to them. So that's how in 2017 he chose exile, and uh, it was you know just in time, really. Uh, maybe someone tipped him off because it was August of 2017 that he self-exiled. In September, there was an enormous and really significant round of arrests targeting opinion leaders, thought leaders in Saudi Arabia, over a hundred of them. They were arrested, disappeared, tortured. Some of them are still in prison. I, I don't know if we, we know all of the names because there might be more who have been arrested, but we just don't know. And we did try to tally their total Twitter following. I mean, if you if you take all of these hundred people and you say, okay, let's tally like how many followers each of them have. Of course, this is not, there might be some overlaps, etc. but it gives you an idea of what was done to the Saudi public sphere and to the Arab public sphere. It was more than 45 million followers in total. So they took down Saudi Arabia's most important voices, the the voices of society, the voices that made opinion, 
And they, in its place, they basically started pumping this information. The first time I actually met Jamal Khashoggi in person was in May in 2018. I invited him to attend the Oslo Freedom Forum in, in Norway. Uh, and so I was kind of his host in Norway. So he came, we met, had a lot of conversations, met a lot of people. Before he left Oslo, we decided that not only are we going to stay in touch, but also we're going to be working on projects together. And I remember very specifically, I mean, we actually interviewed him. We had like a podcast interview with him when he was in Oslo. We had a portable uh, recorder and uh, we're talking to him for like an hour and a half or something. And then we discover that the, the recorder had run out of battery in midway. So we only got like the first, I think, 30 minutes of the interview. And so, you know, my, my colleagues were a little upset because Jamal had to actually leave directly to the airport after that. So like he was, you know, he was doing us a favor. And I remember what I thought at the time. I thought, I mean, it's fine. Jamal is in exile. He's, he's, he's going to be part of our community for a long, long time. He's not going anywhere. And I thought, yeah, the next time we're going to see him, you know, we just, we just do another interview. I mean, he's around. And sure enough, I was supposed to meet him in September in, in New York, and he couldn't make it. And I, I would later find out that the reason why he couldn't make it was because that was when he traveled to Turkey in order to ask for Khadija's hand in marriage, his fiance. So he was basically trying to move on with his life. He was trying to like, you know, now that I'm in exile and that my wife divorced me, I have to build a life for myself in exile. So he was thinking about his personal life, I guess, which is, which is commendable, I guess. I remember October 2nd, 2018. I was in Germany. I was actually doing a, a talk, something about jihadist symbolism and stuff like that. And I was actually with my friend and colleague, uh, Khaled al Bey, who was a Sudanese cartoonist and who also had met with Jamal. I remember I was at the podium preparing for my talk where Khaled comes to me with, with the phone and he's like, did, did you hear about this? He's like, Jamal is missing. And initially I thought, okay, maybe it's nothing. Maybe he's just out of an abundance of caution, knowing that he has received threats before because he did receive threats. He did like over the summer, there were multiple attempts to lure him back to Saudi Arabia, trying to draw him, not only him, but you know, multiple other um, dissidents, trying to basically lure them back to Saudi Arabia where they would be disappeared. And we, we always thought Jamal is smarter than that, you know? And so initially it was odd. It was like, I'm sure it's nothing. I'm sure it's like just within a few hours, he's going to tweet something, you know, or he's going to text us or something. And then, you know, I had to fly back to Norway and things started to look more ominous day by day. This is CCTV of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi entering the Saudi Arabian consulate in Istanbul on October 2nd. He hasn't been seen since. Initially, I thought maybe this is the Turkish intelligence, you know, because maybe this was a kidnapping attempt and they, they ultimately didn't want to kill him. They wanted to take him back to Saudi Arabia where he would be disappeared. So like the, the worst case scenario in my head at the time was, oh my God, we're going to see a video of Jamal saying that he voluntarily returned to Saudi Arabia and you should not concern yourselves with me. I'm going to be fine. Um, I've reconciled with my government. Uh, and then we would not hear from him again. And, uh, you know, his fate would be a complete mystery. It would be like, a, even saying that he was murdered would have been like a conspiracy theory because for all anyone knows, he's back to Saudi Arabia because he couldn't take exile, etc. That's what I thought was the worst case scenario. And so I thought that what had transpired was that the Turkish intelligence leaked this theory that he was killed in order to corner the Saudis and to ask the, so basically like, you know, return him, return him. Otherwise we're going to say that he was killed. So like, I thought it was basically a game between the Saudis and the Turks. But then I remember on the 6th or 7th of October, I remember waking up and realizing that there's no proof of life. And if he was alive, given how the media was treating the story, I realized he was dead. According to audio tappings obtained by the Turkish intelligence, his body parts were dismembered uh, in the Consulate General building. And we heard from the police department and the prosecutor's office that Jamal Khashoggi's body parts uh, were carried in luggages and bags to uh, the residence building close to the consulate. You know, now that I remember it, it, it's filling with me with a sense of loss and grief and sadness. But at the time, it wasn't that. It was a feeling of rage, determination, and a sense of perceived risk, because I felt that 
if they're going to start coming after after dissidents, then we're all in danger. And if we let this pass, then they're going to hunt us down one by one. And I felt that, you know, if there is a list somewhere out there of people who they would like to target, I might not be in the top five or the top ten, but I'm somewhere on the list. And so I felt like this is not just Jamal's fight, this is also mine. Did you order the murder of Jamal Khashoggi? Absolutely not. This was a heinous crime. But I take full responsibility as a leader in Saudi Arabia, especially since it was committed by individuals working for the Saudi government. The rise of Mohammed bin Salman has been described by many, including Jamal Khashoggi, as a coup. This was a coup. The internal Saudi system was demolished. It was replaced by absolute rule. In fact, I remember speaking to someone who has intelligence links, specifically American intelligence links, and he mentioned that his own sources describe MBS as one of two leaders who have the most direct control over their countries, the other being North Korea's leader. The degree of control, of direct personal control that he has over the country is unparalleled, not only in the region, but also in Saudi history. And like I said, you know, his main rivals in this really were his own family. We'd all remember the the November 2017 Ritz incident where he rounded up the most powerful men in the country, whether they be, you know, rival princes, rival to him. They were not rival to the Saudi system. Uh, But also rich individuals, high net worth uh, Saudis and also non-Saudis. And he shook them down. There was torture. There was blackmail. There was hacking the world's most talked-about hotel, Riyadh's most palatial, most prestigious, now a gilded prison. And, uh, you know, he shook them down for money, but eventually it wasn't really just about the money. It was really establishing that I am the one in control. But ultimately, the result of all of this was MBS in total control, Jamal Khashoggi cut off from power, Uh, not only Jamal, of course, but many others. But he was being presented as a savior. He kind of came to the scene in 2014, end of 2014, beginning of 2015, when King Abdullah, the previous monarch, died, and King Salman took power, and King Salman basically appointed him as his deputy crown prince. There was always this criticism, internal criticism, you know, within the Saudi system itself, for the Saudi system as being dominated by old men who are slow to decide and always very careful, too careful, to the point of not being dynamic enough when big events such as the Arab Spring happen. And Hamad bin Salman wanted to present himself as, you know, I'm the guy who's going to be decisive, unlike all of those who came before me. You know, Saudi Arabia was never an interventionist country. It, it never was the kind of country that would invade and overtly bomb another country. Of course, they, they had other means, especially through Islamic extremists, etc. But, you know, at least overt intervention is not something that Saudi Arabia did. Especially because it didn't really need to, because, you know, it has the United States, so the United States could always reliably act on its behalf. But it was very clear that some things also in the relationship between Saudi Arabia and the United States had shifted uh, during the Obama years. But, you know, really going back all the way to, I would say, 2008, 2007, even, you know, we can see its roots in the Iraq war itself. But ultimately, MBS wanted to present himself as this, you know, decisive leader. This was what he's saying to his own family. But then he had another narrative, which he tried to, I don't know if if it's him, I don't know if he's such a genius that he's able to to play 4D chess or whether it was his allies who were advising him. But he presented himself as a reformer, as a liberal reformer. It's so interesting that the crown prince said it's the women's decision to cover or not to cover. The decision is entirely left for women to decide what type of decent and respectful attire she chooses to wear. This is a narrative he still uses. Essentially, you know, this region is so wretched and so backward and so so medieval that we need someone like Mohammed bin Salman to save us from our own wretchedness and backward social norms and religion and stuff like that. This is, of course, a narrative which is employed by so many 
Arab dictators before him. The whole idea, I mean, like the Assads, for example, used it. Saddam used it sometimes. The whole idea that we are not, quote unquote, ready for democracy. The whole narrative was that the Arab Spring failed because you guys are wretched. You can't handle democracy. And so because this this region of 500 million people cannot have democracy, we need Mohammed bin Salman's all over the region. We need liberal reformers who are going to drag us out of the Middle Ages with their own decisiveness. I go back to the point that MBS does not understand the world. And to be frank, he's not very smart. Uh, and many of his actions really backfired. In fact, a close friend of mine and the co-author of the book, The Middle East Crisis Factory, Ahmed Gatnash, he calls him the prince of self-owns. One of our biggest allies against Mohammed bin Salman is Mohammed bin Salman. Interestingly, my relationship, if I can call it a relationship, with the Norwegian Secret Police or Intelligence Services, the PST, actually did not start in 2018. It was late 2016 that ISIS put my name on a hit list. And of course, at the time, it was very scary because ISIS is more unpredictable than a state actor. You know, a state actor would have an embassy that you could at least talk to, but with ISIS, there isn't any of that. And I believe that the threats from ISIS were against the background of my activism, especially my assistance to anti-ISIS activists who were working inside Syria. But, you know, my name, along with a bunch of others, was circulated in telegram channels that are frequented by ISIS supporters. And there was this instruction for, quote unquote, lone wolves to take action. So initially, we kind of uncritically took it as ISIS. And then additional threats came in around April of 2017. And those threats had a different character because the way that they were phrased was, we are watching you and all of your contacts with Norwegian authorities are being recorded and are being transmitted to the leadership. Again, uncritically, I thought, you know, this is linked to the previous threat. And I thought this was ISIS. But then later we started to doubt, I mean, as to whether at least the second threat in April of 2017 came actually from ISIS. We thought that this could be the Saudi authorities. They could be tracking me for a long time. And I had this indication, this feeling that, yes, I was being tracked. At least my name was known to them as someone who was a prominent activist, but also someone who was imprisoned by the United Arab Emirates, you know, their very close ally, and someone who was very well known, like known to the Emirati authorities, at least. And so one of the security consultants, you know, having sat down with him and told him, you know, this is who I am, this is what I do, and this is my history, He commented and said, it would be incompetent of them not to try to track you. On my way, uh, you know, they're taking me to that safe location, the Norwegian intelligence. On my way, they started to tell me because I was scared. And uh, and I I didn't know if the threat was imminent or whether it's something that's a general threat that's not, not really that imminent. But anyway, here's something I said to them. I said, if they don't want to kill me, then I'm not doing my job. So when Norwegian intelligence or any intelligence services really show up at your door and tell you that a powerful country wants to kill you, it's not like they leave and then you carry on with your life. Everything changes. And this was specifically, you know, really deeply frustrating for me for a while because, you know, many people reached out at the time. And I think some people did not really appreciate the degree of disruption that this would cause in my life. Everything becomes more complicated, just everything. You know, taking a walk becomes more complicated. Where my son goes to school, how often I can see him, where I can live, whether he can spend time with me. I had to basically create a system where security measures are made into routines, including digital security. Digital security, of course, was a big part of it. Multiple phones, different kind of system for how to how to get online, uh, multiple layers of protection, VPNs, etc., but also, you know, digital security consultants. The first year, 2019, was very difficult. But by now, these things are almost integrated into my life to the point that I did not have to think so much about them. Of course, travel became much more complicated. I have to, like, inform the Norwegian authorities every time I have to travel. There are countries I'm not allowed to travel to because they cannot protect me in those countries. There are threats that are being directed not only at me, but also at my family, my parents and my sister, who were themselves refugees because after I was expelled from the UAE, they also had to, they were made to leave. And they ended up in Malaysia, where they were waiting for their refugee papers to be processed. My father was a cardiologist, uh, served the United Arab Emirates as a cardiologist for 40 years. 
And then, you know, by the end of it, he was in poor mental health. Uh, the family was reeling. Uh, and on top of that, we started to realize that, yeah, there are threats also being directed to your family in Malaysia. Very vulnerable family, of course. And so I don't want to delve into, into how we did it, but eventually, within a couple of weeks, within three weeks, they were in Canada. Canada had agreed to give them asylum and they had relocated. But of course, this came with its own complication because I'm a stateless Palestinian refugee in Norway. And Canada can be very gracious and open to accepting refugees, but not for visiting if you're a stateless refugee. And so I have not been able to see my family since then. That was one adjustment, one, one painful adjustment really, is like my separation from my family, especially my elderly parents who are in poor health, especially my father. And now it seems that the only way, the only path for me to see my family is once I receive Norwegian citizenship. Silenced is hosted by me, Nicola Kelly. Original music is by Julian Wharton and sound design is by Rick Morris. Special thanks to Iyad El-Baghdadi for speaking to me. Now, if you have 30 seconds free, we would be hugely grateful if you could leave a rating or even better, a review of the podcast wherever you're listening. It really does help other people to find us. If you'd like to hear more about what Article 19 does, drop us a note on Twitter where we're at Article19.org. Thanks for listening.